we're very lucky here at Tuesday Group. We get to learn from our friends and neighbors and our friend and neighbor, John Kopp here, retired. John is retired, okay? Um, in 2020, after a 38 year career as a behavior consultant, he has a master's degree in clinical psychology with an emphasis on applied behavior analysis. Um, you may know John because he's a writer in our community. He's an Ely Folk School instructor. He's an Ely Folk School volunteer. He's part of the writers group and participates in monthly poetry nights. Oh my gosh, which by the way, take place this Thursday at 5 p.m. at the Ely Folk School. The theme is marching to the beat of your own drum. Um, let's see, John is a water quality monitor volunteer and he participates on the Friends of the Library Board and he's a member of a book club. So John is kind of an all out, a, a standout community member and we're so grateful to be able to learn from him today. Please join me in welcoming John to the podium. Thanks everyone. It is uh, truly an honor to speak at Tuesday Group. I think the last time that I spoke here was as a new Eliade back in 2021. And it was very, uh, I was very grateful to be able to do that then. And I'm very grateful to be able to speak in front of all you folks and neighbors and such. Feel free to ask questions as we go along. Um, might have to, Oh, is that bad? <laughs> okay. Um, feel free to ask questions and I'll tr try and, you know, hear them and repeat them and stuff as we go along. What I'd like to do is have this be a lighthearted conversation on kind of a pretty serious topic. And so <laughs> the title of it is A Lighthearted Trip with Learning Theory into the Land of Positive Behavior Supports. And uh, in other words, like it's uh, AKA is uh, challenging behavior communicates. And so is the story part of it, um, I must say this part of this is kind of new to me. I don't think I've ever presented on learning theory and had a learning theory main character be a hot air balloon. <laughs> and so, but now that I'm retired and in the land of creativity, I can do such things. And so that will be the main character of the story, but I'd like to introduce you to the other characters of the story that we're gonna get going on here. Before we do, um, one of the things I'd like to point out is that just by definition, when I talk about challenging behaviors, it could be pretty much any, any behavior or anything someone does that interferes what they want to achieve or causes harm or distraction to others, what have you. Um, I got a quote that, uh, that kind of sums it up in a real global way. And that's a riot is the language of the unheard. And that's Martin Luther King Jr. But on the flip side of the coin, I found a quote, um, that I think is kind of like the yin yang part of it. And it's our nature is to love, to play, to enjoy life. And that's Don Miguel Urez in uh, Four Agreements. And so I guess what I'm saying is that challenging behavior, when we're in it, it certainly seems very um, crisis oriented a lot of times. But on the other hand, our nature is to enjoy ourselves and have fun. And so what we're going to do is bring those together in this story and in this presentation. So the story itself is about learning theory. Learning theory will be the main character. Um, there's other characters in the story and they're caregivers and those they support. There's the five friends of learning who will show up in the story. There's the land itself that the journey will go to and that's the land of positive behavior supports. And there's functional behavior assessment that will be kind of a map into how is it that we begin to understand what um, challenging behavior is communicating to us. And we'll do some discussing and talking about some of the procedures that really pop out over time as far as things that are really helpful.
As we get going here, I'd like to give a special thanks to all the caregivers and people they support who have inspired this story and this presentation. Um, when I use examples as I go along, all the details will be changed to keep anonymity and confidentiality, confidentiality front and foremost. And so no names are used, but also details are changed. I won't talk about where this was happening. It's just, believe it or not, it's a pretty small world. Um, and on the other hand, we're not gonna dive so far deeply into um, detail, graphic details of challenging behavior because it's really much more about what we can take with learning theory into addressing challenging behaviors in a real proactive way. And so here's my plug though, before I go further. And that is uh, this presentation is actually part of a larger vision. And that vision is to have a class where parent-child pairs come together and the class entitled Writing With Your Child For Your Child. And I feel what that's done is brought some things together as far as some real positive, creative ways that families can work together. We do have some things going as far as um, have a family game night at the Ely Folk School, and that'll be offered in April. And also have been doing some uh, playing game to make story. That's been kind of ongoing. The whole idea is that it's a paradox here. The further away you get from thinking that challenging behavior is in your face, the more you're going to be able to understand it and address it. Um, things like developing activities with your children, that you write stories on how you're going to address things as they come up or what's important in one's life, um, those are also going to help kids have the tools to address challenging behaviors. Okay, so enough of the serious uh, background stuff here. So once upon a time, there was an ethereal essence in the world. And this essence was very interested in finding a way to support and help caregivers. But it knew it would not be able to do it in its present form. It couldn't just be going floating around and providing people with a lot of help. So what it decided was, you know, I think what I'm gonna do is I'm going to go out and get some friends um, and have them also join in on this project with me. And then we'll go out in the world and we'll see if we can find a way to help caregivers and the people they support. Before learning theory could do that though, it had to change its form not to get friends, but it was in for a long journey. And so, hence, one day it heard a calling and needed to go out in the world and find friends. So learning theory transformed into the hot air balloon. Now, learning theory had heard some rumblings that uh, there were some real happenings in the world of uh, how people begin to understand things and how they begin to learn what's going on. And so learning through that, hey, you know, I'm going to go check this out. Like here's, there's this weird thing called classical conditioning, and that thing um, might be useful in where I'm headed into the land of positive behavior supports. And so the first friend, and please note, these friends are not rank ordered. Uh, friend number one is not more prestigious than we'll get to friend number five. So the friends, friends of learning, the first one was called classical conditioning. And it's, it's pretty straightforward and it almost seems like so simple. Um, why are we bothering with it? type of thing. And what it says is that if something that has elicits a response, like in, in these, the examples with Pavlov, 
Um, if you present meat powder to a dog, a dog will salivate. That, I mean, that's pretty straightforward. And so learning theory is asking Costco conditioning, like, so what's the big deal? You know, we all kind of like knew that. However, um, what it found out was if you ring a bell and there is no salivation, and then later you pair that bell with the meat powder and you get salivation, then you can present the bell alone down the road and you get salivation. Now this doesn't seem like, how's this gonna help people? You know, what, what really is going on here that's so astounding? And so learning theory is asking classical conditioning, like um, what is it that you have going here that you think is so important that we should be heading out on this trip together? And what the, what the deal is, is classical conditioning says back to learning theory, um, this is really enlightening. This, this means that associations are formed all over the place that we really aren't aware of. And they can go either way. They can be positive associations. That is, if you see me and then later I do something negative, just a sight of me might mean that you're gonna be feeling I'm gonna do something negative. And it can also work in a real positive way. If grandma's car drives up, and your history with her is that you really enjoy the time she spends with you, then later, just the sight of that car is gonna give you pleasure. And that's a really good thing. And so, as I kind of like step out of the story a little bit and go into an example, I was working with one gentleman who was about uh, 55 and he'd been in an institution all his life. And, what i think i'll use a different example sorry <laughs> i like this next one better <laughs> working with a young man he is about um 30 years of age and he had he lived with his parents but he had some real challenging upcoming events he was going to have to become more independent and he, he was going to have to begin to do some things on his own or at least that was what the, his team of people that were supporting him were talking about. Well, what happened in response to that was because of who he was, he became very fearful. And then when his caregiver came and presented herself in the morning, as she'd always done for five years, and he had really liked it, he became real angry with her and really belligerent with her. And it would just wreck in the mornings um, because he was, he had associated her with his having to move or his having to address the issue of should I move and should I be more independent. Now, as we gathered information, um, got to know him, like I'd go over there at six in the morning and get to know him and talk to him and stuff, found out he really liked cats and he really had a good sense of humor. So what we did was um, I took in the caregiver, fortunately, you had a really good sense of humor too. Because what we did was took a picture of the caregiver and pictures of cats and put the picture of the caregiver's face onto the body of the cats. And then she showed up in the morning as she usually did. And he was in on this um, and she was too, but he was in on this. And so he's sitting at the table now and he's like, just can't wait to see her face when she sees that there's cat bodies to her face because we put them on placemats at the breakfast table. And so we're all sitting there and she comes in and she sits down and it's like, oh my gosh, you know, what's this? And he just laughed and laughed and laughed. And through that simple association, he got past that, not liking her coming in the morning because of the meeting she'd been at. And so it tells us, and classical conditioning tells us, and that's why it's going to hop on board with learning theory, is that people are pretty sensitive. 
you make a lot of associations and connections that you don't really know where they come from and stuff. But on the other hand, people, <clears throat> excuse me, people are very resilient. And if you find, and if you're creative, you can find ways of pairing positive things with those situations within the past have been aversive. So anyway, learning theory got his first friend and off they went floating through the air and they had heard some real rumblings about a lot of research and development in the whole area of operant conditioning. And so operant conditioning was the next friend that they were gonna seek out and see if they could get operant conditioning to join them on their trip to the land of positive behavior supports. Now, operant conditioning um, just kind of simply says, if you do something and you get rewarded, that you're gonna be doing it more frequently. That'll increase that probability. And again, it's a real, real simple principle. I mean, that's kind of what learning theory is. It's these really simple principles that are real challenging to be consistent enough to get you know, some good results. But anyway, so operant conditioning was all excited and he's like, oh man, learning theory, you gotta, you gotta see what I'm coming up with here. I've got, I've got just like this whole thing figured out. Classical conditioning is too straightforward. It doesn't cover things. Whereas operant conditioning lets us know we're operating our environment. And I've got this, I got this magic box figured out and I wanna show it to you. So in this magic box, the world was defined according to operant conditioning. And it said, if you take a stimulus, that means um, like something like food. Oh, by the way, they made me order food so I wouldn't come around and pick it off you guys' plate. I just thought I'd let you know that. Okay, so what this says is if you present something positive to a person, say some food, some money, some type of reward, um, that they like, the quality of the stimulus is they like it and you're giving it, it's called positive reinforcement. So if you ever hear the term positive reinforcement, it just means that something follows the behavior and it's enjoyed and it increases the likelihood of behavior occurring. Now, if you remove something and the person doesn't like that something and you removed it from them, that's called negative reinforcement. And that's a little counterintuitive, um, but what it means is suppose a child's in the room and they're, they're kind of like trashing it and you figure out that, well, there's just too much sound in here, there's too much music, there's too much um, lighting, there's just too much chaos, and you take away that stuff because you intuit that the child um, doesn't like it, then what you find out is the child um, quits trash in the room and, and is engaged in more appropriate behaviors. So it's like the more appropriate behaviors increase. And that's, um, so that's an example of it, but those aren't so important to know the distinction in the terminology, but what's important with this box is type one and type two punishment. If you add something following um, a behavior and the result is the behavior decreases is punishment. Now that's, I mean, straightforward, whether it's from child rearing or whether it's within a behavior management type of situation, that's called type one punishment. Um, if you take something away and um, 
it's something the person likes, then that's called type two punishment. Now, those two types of punishment um, have been leaned on a lot. And what that means is people begin to equate, well, if you want challenging behavior not to be there, you're gonna have to make somebody accountable and you're gonna have to punish somebody. And a lot of that comes from like child rearing. And I'm not saying people here are thinking that way, but I'm saying over time, that is kind of the thinking that went on. And so lo and behold, um, what operant conditioning found out from classical conditioning and from learning theory was that it had to stay home on this trip to positive behavior supports. Yeah, it was bummed. And so <laughs> what that meant was into this land of positive behavior supports where we're going, punishment is not used. It's not used for a number of reasons, but it's not used because there's side effects. A person that's doing the punishment might become a conditioned punisher. Um, it's, there's no empirical evidence that says that if you use punishment, um, it's gonna be more effective than reinforcement. And so operant conditioning being a good guy in this, good gal, I guess, she says, hey, that's fine, I'm cool with it. I'll leave it behind. I got trust in you guys. Off with it, go into the line of positive behavior supports. And that was huge. That was a huge decision, but she went with it really well. And they're back on the road again, the air road. So the next, uh, next situation, next place they hear about is, well, this guy, he's, he's like doing all this kind of work with thoughts and cognitions um, instead of like stimulus and reinforcement. He's, he's getting into the head of things and he's found out some neat stuff. And so let's go check with him. And so learning theory takes uh, classical conditioning, operant conditioning, and they land uh, where cognitive behavior therapy is being worked with. And they say, hey, you know, what, what's the big deal? What's the big deal here that cognitive behavior therapy type of stuff? And cognitive behavior therapy is all excited and saying, oh man, you, you won't believe this, but um, this, this connected so much stuff. This whole idea of our thoughts and how we're using our thoughts is connected to, to many, many things. And for example, one of the things this person was working on was um, depression and found out that if you can begin to check or backing up just a little bit, found out that through his interviews that we often overgeneralize from our negative thoughts. And I think we all kind of know that, but I don't think we ever give a lot of thought to, well, where does that lead? Um, and not saying it leads there for everybody, but where can it lead? And so, for example, if someone's rude to you, um, our mind is not always our ally, and our mind might say, oh, that person doesn't like me. Well, come to think of it, most people don't like me. That's, what, <laughs> that's overgeneralizing. We do that more than we like to admit, I feel. Um, I can speak for myself anyway. Um, and so this was the, this was kind of like the deal where cognitive behavior therapy got its foothold. After that, um, it was able to go along and get into things like, okay, if, if, my, if it matters what I'm thinking, I can learn to think some things that'll talk me through some stuff. So for example, I can learn to um, say I'm gonna be stressed. I know I'm gonna have to deal with something I don't like to. I'm gonna have to, um, what the heck don't I like to do? Who knows? But <laughs> I'm going to have to go to the garage and spend it done on my car or something. And so there's that. What, what cognitive behavior therapy would tell you to do um, through some of the research is done is you can learn to prepare for that mentally. Like, I know what to do when I get there. I'm going to be polite with the person, even though I may feel I'm being overcharged. I'm just going to ask the right questions um, because. My experience there is what's, is what's important and I know I can do this. And then 
when I get done with doing that, I'm going to treat my, I'm going to tell myself how good I'm doing. And so you, you do that. Um, it's the morning of the car repair time and you decide, Hey, I really do want to um, make this work. And so I know what to, you say to yourself. Self, I know what to do when I get there. I'm going to ask the right questions. I'm going to take it nice and easy. I'm going to have the person explain things to me. I'm going to make a choice. Anything I'm not sure of, I'm just going to say put on hold, and I'll check with I'll check later on that. And then you go there and you talk yourself through it, and you get done, and you reinforce yourself. I did great. I did great. I stuck to that one little plan, but that one little plan of how I thought got me to a much better place. See, these are very simple concepts, but it's really hard to do because we often get in habits that just kind of interrupt those things or something more important comes up. All right. As uh, just stepping out of this story a little bit then, um, to, tell, to give you an example of how how this can work. Um, I was, uh, I worked in one of the places I worked, I had an outreach office in a little country town and it was in the, the courthouse. And so people from the area would come, which is kind of weird, but people from the area would come to the courthouse to get, if I got stressed when they saw the courthouse then they needed therapy when they got in. But, <laughs> I never thought of that then. <laughs> I do now. <laughs> but uh, what they did was um, people would come there and you'd have, you know, your office and, and they'd come in. It was called outreach and stuff because you had driven out from a different town. And it was, it was wonderful. It was like one of the best experiences of my life um, for the couple of years I did that. You'd really, you'd really connect with people. Um, it's just kind of like you're out in the country, but yet you're connecting with what's going on with them. Well, a gentleman came in with his wife and they said, uh, you know, we're here because a doctor sent us. Oh, well, which doctor? Well, the one at the, one of the hospitals that I had to go to over Thanksgiving because I thought my wife was poisoning me. And so it's like, oh, okay, uh, that's, <laughs> That's interesting. Um, and so we talked and found out that he was, you know, he was depressed, very depressed. And as part of that, and I don't make light of these situations, but he was depressed. And as part of that depression, he became real paranoid that um, his wife was going to hurt him. Um, but the, on the upside, um, he had a very good relationship with his wife. We talked and we developed a good relationship. So it was kind of like the three of us working with him um, and us, but working with him. And in exploring it, there was found out that he hadn't um, taken a vacation from his dairy farm in 1500 days. And so it, it was really understandable how he was feeling. But why he didn't was because of the irrational thoughts that nobody else can take care of my dairy farm when I'm gone. However, in the close relationship um, with him and his wife helping, we we're able to let him know um, that that's what his thinking was. But when we check into the facts, there was a lot of capable people that were more than happy to, and responsible people, take care of his farm. Um, I know that dairy farms require a lot of work and long hours and stuff, but they, they were willing to do that, and so they did. Um, he went on vacation to Las Vegas and got over his depression. But it was, not because he went to Las Vegas per se, but uh, he lost the farm there, and then he was, no, no, seriously, just kidding. I apologize for that. Um, he got over his depression because he saw that, wow, my thoughts were causing me to feel a certain way. But you know what? There's ways I can have some say over what my thoughts are saying. And seeing this happen, I um, helped him out and 
he got over his depression. Okay, so we're back in the air, we're floating around. We've got classical conditioning, operating conditioning, um, cognitive behavior therapy. There we go. And so those three, they're floating around and they're discover, deciding that, uh, okay, well, the next winds that are talking to us, where are they coming from? And learning theory says, well, well, everybody, it comes from uh, social learning. Social learning is this happening um, that actually really backs up cognitive behavior therapy. And the social learning says, you know, people don't have to be directly involved in these reinforcement and punishment situations to be learning things and then later performing them. And so social learning theory kind of like did some, in their eyes, some groundbreaking work into if children are watching people get reinforced for the violent behavior, they're more likely to become violent. Um, and likewise, um, if people are able to see people cope with situations in constructive problem solving ways, they pick up on that, they learn it. A meaning they watch it and watch it and watch it. You don't, doesn't look like anyone's learning. Then you present the situation and sure enough, compared to people that haven't been exposed to that, they have learned and they're able to cope with those situations. So it might be situations about what do you, you know, what do you do if um, friends say, bad things to, or how, what do you do if you have to engage in um, asking your boss for a raise or something like that, but whatever you, whatever it is, being able to see someone coping with it is very helpful. In fact, seeing someone cope with something is more helpful than seeing someone who's a master at it. And once you think, as that settles in, it makes sense. That is, if I'm watching somebody, I'm learn to say, do a certain work task, whatever it is around the yard. Um, and I'm seeing what they do when they get to problems and how they work through them. I'm gonna learn a lot more than if I'm just watching somebody um, breeze through something. It's like I will hardly even catch that. Okay, so one of the big experiments that came out of this, that kind of um, controversial experiment, but what it showed was that if children, bottom line was if children were watching things that were violent on television, um, and then they were seeing adults like be violent and get reinforced for that, then they were more likely to, get this Bobo doll that was in the room that they could then play with. And I say it's controversial because it's just hard to set experiments up that directly test that. What we get out of it though, is that we've always known um, you have to set good examples for your children. I mean, that's, that's like common sense. But when you see the evidence, when you see that information come back to you, um, that, wow, if they see me constructively work through something, they're going to work through something better. And if they see me rewarding somebody, they're going to be picking up on that and they're going to be more likely to be rewarding people. And if they see I'm rewarding friends or their friends for talking well, they're going to be speaking well too. Um, it becomes a real powerful and impactful tool. And so with that, Synopsis, uh, social learning got back on the balloon with classical conditioning, operant conditioning, and cognitive behavior therapy. And so they're out there floating around. And learning theory, being the wise hot air balloon, says, you know, this is all really good, but we're really heady. This is a lot in the head you know, where reinforcement schedules and where um, challenging your rational thoughts. And this is all just, this is all, this is all good, but it's really heady. We need the heart too. 
We need to join the mind with the heart if we're going to head into positive behavior support land. And so what they did was they listened in the winds and they found, okay, who's working with the heart? Who's working with just um, the whole idea that human to human is powerful and necessary? And they came across a procedure and someone working with it is called gentle teaching. And gentle teaching is a way, um, it's kind of like there's, there's, there are those four ways of learning. And then a fifth way that is the heart way is gentle teaching. And what that means is that when you're, and it's used to address real challenging behaviors. Um, and what that means is if you're with somebody um, and you want to um, engage in, in a way that's going to help them be the most comfortable in the world, then they promote what's called gentle teaching. And gentle teaching starts with this unconditional positive regard. Like there is no other place you want to be than with that person. And that's something that can be projected. And it's something that we can learn to settle into. We're very task oriented. And so we often think about what, we're, what we could be doing. But if we can settle into gentle teaching, which is a very person first method, um, it's based on unconditional positive regard. That means telling somebody what you like about them, um, it's also a way, a time for letting go of our biases. For example, I'd work with parents and some of the things they would say is, my dad never would have let me get away with I have to let what I have to let my kid get away with. And so it's just a, it's just a bias. But if we identify our bias when we're sitting with somebody like, oh, when they talk like that, I'm, I'm, I'm starting to feel a little nervous or anxious about it. That is then gonna help us settle back into accepting that person. <clears throat> another thing to look at is to be very, another way of putting it all is to be very generally present. And so before we go further, because in a flash, they picked up the fifth friend and gentle teaching got to go with them. So they're gonna have five friends now that are heading off to the land of positive behavior supports. But, We'll step out of the story in just a bit, just for an example of gentle teaching. I was working with a man um, who was about 60 years old and he would not go to the doctor. And this was an issue because he had a lot of medical concerns. He walked poorly with a walker. He used a wheelchair. He had 24-hour staff. Um, but he had a hard life. And it was real understandable. For example, he had learned a lot of associations because he had been institutionalized most of his life. And he had thoughts of, he'd, you know, he'd, the doctors, he'd hear the doctors at night. And, and they, he'd really be scared by that. He'd have dreams about it. And so his behavior, his way of things was, he was very traumatized. His way of things was to be belligerent and be tough and literally hit people if they were, you know, trying to help them in any way. And it was very sad. And so in working with him, um, what it was involved was gentle teaching. And what that means is that sitting with him and telling him sincerely and authentically how there's no place I wanted to be but sitting there with him and talking with him. And then I had to show him that. We discussed baseball. He was a big Twins fan. It was the same game over and over that he talked about. He was a big Twins fan. Um, there was also things like fishing that he liked. And so we just talked and we talked and we talked and got to a point where we really were comfortable with each other, where he understood that he's making my day as much as I'm trying to make his day, that there's an interdependency here. And it isn't just about you know, it isn't about me at that moment trying to get him to do something. It's about me letting him know how human engagement is very real and there is nothing more important. And so 
what ended up happening was that even expressed to him, he was, he told me out some more of his fears. He was fearful when he would have to go from his walker up to in the van that he would fall over. I mean, he hadn't told people this before. He was also fearful about other transfers that he hadn't mentioned. And so what we ended up doing was, um, I told my bar on my mom's car, she had a Malibu that you do not have to step up into. It's like low. <laughs> and so she, she gladly borrowed us her car. And he went, you know, we went through the process and he went to the medical appointments and that became kind of part of his routine. And what that shows is that we could have probably used all those other pages of reinforcement and, you know, what have you. And that have been good. I mean, it's all good. But what he needed was he needed a person. He needed somebody. All right, so. The friends of learning are landing in positive behavior support land. Dun, da, 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 da. Now, the land of positive behavior supports is more like a realm than a geographical locality. It's a place, and it's a place where there's unity through diversity, where you understand that all the differences that everybody has, it's good, and that's what makes us. It's a place where a realm is committed to understanding what behavior communicates. Because now we're getting back to the whole idea that challenging behavior communicates. So we're kind of like going into this world where, okay, we're taking we're taking some understanding and we're we're putting in a bigger picture into the world. Um, it could be it's a very proactive way, meaning you don't wait for things to go wrong to create a, a great world. You create a great world and help things not go wrong. But it, and it can take place in homes, schools on work programs, care facilities, what have you. However, with learning theory and with a lot of situations, it takes a map to guide to find your way around it. Um, and so that's what a functional behavior assessment does. It kind of like maps out the territory of the challenging behavior. And this is really complicated. I think, but what it says is a functional behavior assessment, you gather as much information as you possibly can on the situation, the challenging behavior. Someone's hitting somebody, um, you're gathering all the information you can. Hypothesize function simply means that you take, you're gonna take your best guess at what this behavior means. Because say the behavior is hitting, you don't go to the um, PR and, and see what's the prescription for hitting, you do the functional behavior assessment and come up with what does the hitting mean? The hitting may mean something like I miss my mom. The hitting may mean something like I don't understand what the instructions are. The hitting may mean something like um, I want to raise, no. <laughs> what have you. And okay. And so then once you get the meaning and we usually put in form of I statements like, I need to understand the instructions. I need to be able to socialize with Bill, what have we, whatever it is. Then you address, you address it across a realm of areas. You address it by environmental changes, meaning that you may post instructions on the walls. Um, you address it by teaching skills. You may teach the person to ask instead of hitting. You address it by direct treatment, and that's the reinforcement procedures, trying to motivate the person to not be hitting. And remember, we you don't, there isn't a punishment for hitting. You don't take something away. Um, you don't negatively um, impact the person. What you do do, though, is you use nonviolent crisis intervention techniques and you help the person get to a point of not needing to hit through the engagement and debriefing process. 
and then um, positive performance feedback in this great big huge map means if I'm a caregiver and I'm committed to, okay, I'm going to do these three things differently. If somebody doesn't let me know that I'm doing them differently, I'm going to drift back to the way I'm doing them. That's just kind of, <clears throat> it's one of the main reasons that plans that we try are very hard to get to happen. Isn't because the plans are usually defunct because people usually do come to a good understanding of other people. It's more like people aren't getting the feedback because when you first start working on things, you might be as a unit working on like 37% meaning that's so many times the percentage of carrying out what you think you're going to carry out and only through that feedback are you able to raise it up to like the 90 percent where it then becomes effective and let's see what time okay cool that's perfect so all right so when we look at <clears throat> The functional behavior assessment. What we're looking at is, and this is where a lot of work comes in, um, because, like I said, the the principles are really, really straightforward, but the work is really hard. And so, if something is happening and it's going to be addressed, regardless of what setting it is, there needs to be a lot of information collected on it, um, and sometimes. And in the real world, so to speak, the information needs to happen over, be collected over a period of time. There's some people I worked with that for five years, we kept learning things. And you always keep learning things, but I mean, kept learning major, major things. Um, and so what you do is you gather um, information. And one of the most important things is antecedents or what happens just before that behavior, because you're trying to identify what sets it off. So you're trying to identify the setting. Um, what happens after the behavior refers to, it could be anything. Um, people say nice things, people run away, you know, whatever happens. So those, those are two very main things. And then what the behavior looks like, because it's one thing for me to give an example and say hitting, and we all just like, okay, hitting, concept of hitting. But in, in real life, behavior, Two people can look at a situation and come up with different ways that it look. And so that's a real important area. And then you look at the likes, dislikes, um, where the person's at social, emotionally, their strengths, needs, their history, the developmental level, and communication skills. And you could go on and on. You can never learn too much. And this is in the context of a therapeutic environment, a team of people collecting information. I mean, a real invested type of thing. Okay, so wanted to give a few examples where we had to use um, had to use you know the functional behavior assessment and kind of what came up with just to give you an idea. Okay, um, one of the examples, there was a 14 year old girl, she lived in a home where um, there was medically fragile people and there were also people with behavioral challenges. And she was very aggressive. Um, staff of sound mind thought she was possessed. Um, so it was, it was pretty intense. Um, you'd have to go over like three o'clock in the morning and it looked really, um, Place, you know, it was it, she. Her placement was in jeopardy. It was really, really a tough situation. Felt for everybody involved. Um, but as we begin to collect the information, and it's and you have to keep you have to keep dealing with the world as you collect the information. You can't say, okay, world stop. I want to collect the information. But as we collected the information, there was a couple of things that we were guided to see. And one was that she wanted to be in control 
and I know you may think, well, that's obvious, but um, it's kind of like the deal where what some, when some people want something, um, their deprivation from it might mean they really want something. Um, it's like a person came out of the desert and they were thirsty and they said to you, I'm thirsty. Well, you wouldn't say, well, everybody needs water. You know, you, so you don't say to this person, everybody needs control. You see it as a very intense thing. There was another um, part that came out of it in that I want to be like everybody else. And again, you could say, well, everybody wants to be like everybody else, but no, not in these situations. Just like you wouldn't say um, to a person that hadn't eaten in a week, um, well, we all need food. And so it's kind of like a person's level of deprivation comes out and you begin to understand how powerful the need is. And so we set a program up and it was um, a couple of things going on and one of many things going on, actually. I mean, the whole environment changed. We begin to, you know, clear the area immediately upon certain antecedents and very different things, but there was a couple of things that really stood out. One of them was that she knew sign language. She didn't have verbal skills. And so we had her teach staff that were coming on board sign language. And that helped to be a part. And we did that. And then we set up reinforcement procedures. And if behaviors you know, hadn't happened, um, then a coupon gets punched, and if that happens so many days in a row, so many days, then you cash it in for an outing type of thing with somebody. Um, it, that didn't seem to be working, and then we that was when we kind of like got honed in on oh, but that doesn't address control at all. And so when we added a very simple component was she chose who would take her on the outing. Boom! It just change is like flipping a switch. And so that addressed the area of control. And this doesn't reflect the level of work that goes into something like this, but it, but it does affect the power of when you, when the answer pops out at you and you address it in the right way. And she changed. Um, life, life got a whole lot better for her. Um, down the road, some staff from that place uh, became her guardian. There was a good relationship developed. All right. And so there's one other one. Just to kind of like show you this can happen. This is applicable across ranges. There was a kid who was two years, eight months of age. And he was approaching three. He was being seen by um, infant development therapists, I call them. And he was, he could tantrum and it was just totally intense. It would disrupt the whole household. It would keep their mornings from progressing. And it would, you wouldn't think that could, when you see it, then you would think that, but it, uh, it disrupts everything. There's another child in the house, getting going in the morning is a big deal when you got a job that you're going to, and it's a big deal anyway. It's a heck of a way to start the day like that. But mom would just be doing normal things in guiding him along and saying things to him. And he would be like, just seems it, when you look at it, it look like, oh, for no reason at all, I just blew off the handle. But when we, when we really got into it and looked at this and, and took sensory things into consideration, what we hypothesized was that um, he was just, there were some sensory issues going on here. He was set off by sound. His mom's voice triggered him, not because his mom had a grating voice. It was just, it just did. And so, with that hypothesis, what we did was we um, made up some real simple picture routines to follow. And she just would walk up to him and hear and show him what it was they were doing next. He fell in love with them. He would be riding in the car and he'd be pointing like this and it would mean we should stop at grandma's house. It was, it was just him. That's just the way he was. 
but it was found out because we, you know, took the time and life didn't stop, but took the time to gather information and then address the meaning of what that information said. And that information said, I cannot handle the sound right now. And so we addressed that meaning. We didn't, and there were, um, it was real interesting because we went back there after a couple of weeks, it was like, oh yeah, things are fine. And life just went on for us. So, all right, well, I'm not sure if we have time to get, do we still have time? Okay. All right, so in wrapping up, I just, a laundry list of <laughs> procedures that pop out that seem to be, you know, like indicated at times. And so we won't give a lot of, we don't have time to go into a lot of detail, but know that over the years, there's procedures that often pop up like, oh, well, this would be useful here to address this meaning when you keep seeing certain procedures pop up. One of them is like using visuals. Visuals really connect with a different part of someone's um, psyche or their feeling. It, it can get straight to the heart of things. And so we use, often use visual schedules. And we, we do that. We have many visual um, things around that trigger real positive emotions with us. Sensory accommodation, sensory is huge. Um, we can tell, we walk into certain buildings and the lighting is a certain way and we become depressed. Um, or certain noises set us off. Involvement, like the girl that, 14 year old girl at this home, she's seeing all these staff do their thing, but she's not involved. Um, people really seem to fare well with involvement, caring, that just refers to really finding ways to show people you care. Partial participation. If you're working with somebody, um, then any chance you get that they're involved in whatever it is you're doing, have them involved in whatever it is you're doing. So even if you're working with kids, um, if you're cooking, they should be, they could be cooking. I mean, it, it changes the atmosphere of life. Um, verbal praise, and that never say good job. Tell someone specifically. <laughs> what it is that works, uh, visual, social, emotional stories. And that's where I'll just jump. What I, like I worked with uh, one girl and she, um, she was always telling her mom what to do. And if her mom didn't, didn't listen, she would just be totally flying off the handle and very disruptive. And she was doing it because she thought that's the way the world was supposed to be. She was on the autism spectrum um, and thought that's the way the world was supposed to be. Well, what we did was uh, she had some favorite characters and these characters were like Anna and Elsa, frozen characters. And so cut and pasted and made these social books and they allowed for kind of like this problem solving and showing it's okay the way to do it this way and it's okay to listen to mom because we had a mom in there. And she like, that's fine. Okay, I can listen to that. That's cool. Because it wasn't a personal thing. She was just wanting to connect with the right way of doing things. And so um, kind of some of the inspiration for the class, writing with your child for your child is that. Um, the idea is that Parents have a lot of um, good direction that they want to somehow, or values they want to instill with children. Children have heroes. They have people that they want to um, emulate or want to look to for advice. They don't want to be hearing it from mom and dad and brother and sister. And so the idea is um, writing a book where the theme of it, the parent gives a lot of input into that, and it's a picture book. And with words and pictures. And the parent gives a lot of input into that because it might be a value like honesty, a value like helping somebody, even if you're late for work, um, to stop and help somebody if they need to be helped. That might be a family value that parents want to pass on. Um, and you can role model it, of course, but it may not happen for a while. But if you write a book together with your child and then the child picks the hero, 
and the child's hero might be some Marvel superhero. And so they get in those kind of situations where they have to make those decisions. And they work, parent child work collaboratively um, on coming up with the coming up with the solutions. It's like like stories are going along, and then you get to a challenge, you work through the challenge, and then there's a solution to it, and world's good again. All right, thank you. <laughs> We so appreciated learning from you. Thank you everyone for being here this week. We'll see you next week. Julie, did you have a question? Do you want to ask it? Well, you know, like any of us, Christian, I think, by running across and we don't have the background to know to keep the same direction where one could find out well, I mean, if it's seniors, Alzheimer's is so serious. Okay. You know, I mean, her question is where would you find resources? Um, in, in just general situations. You know, with my mindset, um, sometimes I look at, well, what's a general situation? Because, you know, I'm, I'm so analytical in that area. So, but what I do is there's one area, just in general, because I, I get what you're saying. Um, it just takes me a little bit to shift. But one of the areas that's really becoming big is this whole self-help arena. And there's good stuff out there. And what that means is through a Google search, you can come up with who's working on these different topic areas and what they're coming up with. For example, when I was preparing for this, um, I actually ended up checking out a book from the library because I came across Untangling Anxiety. Um, and it was like, it just caught my ear because the guy talked about negative reinforcement. And then I looked it up and here he was a neuropsychiatrist from Brown University he had published five books and and he got one out there but it all began with me simply because that at least that's what I do I listen to what's being presented um, in certain areas and then they talk about something and I track that down and they talk about something that's you know because I'm no longer connected with um, who is doing what in the work world but I'm very much connected with who's doing what in the world and so I begin with, uh, it's almost like a Google search podcast, YouTube on a topic. And there's really some good stuff out there. Um, by that, I mean, it's easy to see, okay, they've published several books. Um, they're referenced by somebody else. Like the one that I got, I got checked out from the library. And it's like, holy cats, this guy's got about five people I know on the back book cover. Um, and so that's, that's it. I don't, I literally in this day and age, I don't have like, okay, here's my list of resources um, that I go to for certain things. I just 